point zero 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 yeah you know one is so small that you can discard it right you can make like it's not there it's okay you know those are infinities they don't mind okay then there's what's called very technically actually you find that in technical books nasty infinities okay <laughs> nasty infinities are quantities that are infinitely big right so that is not an infinity that you can just say we'll make like it's not there right so, because it's an infinite amount of something and so you got to deal with it and in general if a theory gives a result that says nasty infinity that says this is an infinite amount of something the theory is either discarded or renormalized okay renormalization means that they use some fundamental physical constant they apply it and they, they cut the number they say it's a finite number <laughs> so what they did is when the when quantum theory started to analyze the structure of the vacuum at the quantum level that means at the atomic level it, you know or subatomic particles they realized that in order for the particles to do what they were doing to have the energy they have da, 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 the vacuum the equation gives infinite amount of energy there's got to be infinite amount of vacuum energy for atoms to do what they did and that was not acceptable so what happened is that they used the Planck's uh, length um, they got rid of the infinity by using the Planck's distance which is 1.616 multiplied by 10 minus 33 just happens to be very close to a phi ratio by the way uh, that uh, is a mathematical constant that's given for the smallest thing the universe does <laughs> okay it's billions of times smaller than an atom even smaller than the hex boson they're looking for it actually with that accelerator you're trying to get mini black holes mini white holes to appear but the Planck's distance is what we assume is the end. The universe goes to that, and then it goes, that's it, that's small enough, I'm not doing anything small. <laughs> All right, that's it. Okay, now, it might be a fundamental boundary, but that boundary is most likely just that, a boundary. And that's the boundary that we can experience in terms of our capacity to solve the physics at hand. Uh, so they used that, and what they did is they used that little concept of a small little Planck's distance, and they took a centimeter cube of space, a centimeter cube of vacuum, and they said, how many of these little Planck's distance would we have to put in that centimeter cube of space to fill it up? And that will give us a finite number for the energy of the vacuum. For how much energy there is in the vacuum, and we won't have this nasty infinity at the end of our quantum view. Wow. That's one way to go about it. And so they took little Planck's distance and they stacked them up. All right? Now, at the end of the equation, when they calculated how many of these little Planck's distance they had to put in there and what's the density of a centimeter cube of vacuum, the density was still, and it's still to this day, 10 to the 94 grams per centimeter cube. 10 to the 94, that's 10 with 93 zeros on the end, all right? Okay, uh, grams, grams of, you know, energy. Uh, per centimeter cube of space. Now, <laughs> that is a very, very, very large number. That is an extremely large number. And if you were to try, if I was to try to give you an example, an idea of what that is, uh, if I took all the stars we saw, we see in the universe with the Hubble, okay, all the way back almost to the Big Bang. And I, like all the stars, like there's billions of stars in each galaxies, there's billions of galaxies, and you stuck them all into the same cube of space, you still wouldn't achieve 10 to the minus, uh, 10 to the 94 grams per centimeter cube. You still wouldn't have the vacuum density. You imagine, I mean, that's a, you need a large trash compactor, you know, and put all the stars in there. Imagine how. Imagine how dense that would be. I mean, like, 
Well, that wouldn't even be the vacuum. So, and do we know that our equations are completely out of line? That like this is just like some mathematical error we did? We do. Uh, actually, there's experiments that have proved the density of the vacuum. That is, the cashmere effect has been uh, done in laboratories and over and over and over. They can pl put two plates close enough together so that uh, some of the long wavelengths of the vacuum energy cannot get in between the plates. And since, since they're on the outside of the plates, they create a pressure that pushes the plate together. Those equations were calculating, calculated by Kashmir in, in, in uh, 1947, I believe. And, you know, but at the time, there was no way to put two plates that close together uh, without electrostatic problems and all this stuff. And so it wasn't done until the 90s, I believe. And then it was repeated and repeated. And now they're able to even have little teeny weeny, you know, uh, balance scales that they put a plate on one side and it pushes the scale down. And so it, um, it's, and it's exactly the pressure that was calculated by Kashmir in 1947. So you know the equation is correct. So that is telling you that it's really there. I mean, the vacuum has that density, and you're swimming in it, <laughs> you know? You are like a fish in the vacuum structure. You are like, you know, operating in it, and most likely, according to my theories, the vacuum is the fundamental structure under which you came to existence. You came right out of it. And it's a fractal structure of information moving through. I mean, one of the most obvious things when people ask me, well, you know, why do you think the universe is fractal? Well, you can see fractal structures everywhere in nature, how nature evolves. But, but one of the most obvious things is that people come out of other people. <laughs> that is just an amazing thing, <laughs> okay? That is good evidence for the fractal nature of the vacuum emerging literally out of other people. And this, you know, and, and I had pictures of my grandma, or I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, my grandma and her grandma and my mom on the same picture, right? And I could see the fractal division of space like I mean this is and so this structure is um, and so I started to think at that time that the vacuum may be the fundamental dynamics of the division of creation and that from that vacuum dynamics you get uh, structures at various level that self-organizes in ways in which they support each other so that you get a biosphere that has you know fractal divisions creating you know vegetation and so on and then eventually more and more complexity and you get ma mammals and then eventually you get so that starts to change our understanding from a physics perspective from a perspective of fundamental physics, even starting to change our perspective of evolution and biology. And I've been collaborating with various biologists throughout the years, one of them being Elizabeth Turris, which is excellent evolutionary biologist, and uh, Michael Heisen on the Big Island, and so on. And it's exciting because really it's the first physics theory that includes biology and evolution and you know that could unify not only the four fields of physics uh, which is really important to do but actually the concepts of biology and the evolutionary structures of biology but as well even the emergence of consciousness out of the biological structures and why why would i say that and i'm going to finish on that because I want you guys to have the time to ask questions. And this next section, I won't have time to finish if I start it. So, uh, you know, let me give you an example. There's this big raging battle that's going on about is, you know, was um, 
was uh, Darwin correct or is it, you know, some God organizing nature? And, 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 and you know, it's really a mute point because it's not one or, you know, it's most likely neither of these, <laughs> but something most likely somewhere in between. And, um, you know, and this concept of the division of space and the structure of the vacuum really starts to give you an idea on how the information transfer produces these dynamics. And one of the problems with evolutionary stories that we hear from, you know, mostly Darwinian views is that there is no evidence for uh, macro transformation of species. That is, you can find lots of evidence for, you know, a turtle coming to the land and developing claws so that they can dig in the sand and dig in the dirt 